I'm glad the Deputy First Minister has warmed us up. <laughs> the First Minister and others do not need to follow that example. For, we turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Presiding Officer, today in Scotland, in an S2 class of 30 pupils, on average five can't write properly. That is double the number just four years ago. When the First Minister sees statistics like these, does she feel embarrassed, ashamed, or both? First Minister. Actually, what I feel is utterly determined, uh, determined to carry on with the changes we are making in Scottish education so that we continue to see the improvements in attainment and progress in closing the attainment gap. Ruth Davidson points to uh, the S2 performance uh, in writing in the SSLN study published this week, and I'm not going to uh, try in any way to diminish uh, the significance of those findings, but I think it is important I think it is important to say this. Uh, that study, which is a sample study, measures S2 pupils against the standard that they are expected to reach in S3. And what we know now from the much more comprehensive data that we are publishing through the National Improvement Framework, which we will continue to publish on an annual basis and which will become informed by the new standardised assessments, is that we see over 80% uh, of pupils in S3 meeting the standard that they're required to meet. So we will continue to take forward the measures that have been guided by OECD recommendations. For example, our new uh, attainment ch challenge, our new attainment fund, which as the Deputy First Minister has just said, is directing resources to head teachers. The new benchmarks for literacy and numeracy that have been put in place, backed by a range of targeted programmes uh, from the attainment challenge Book Bug, the Play Talk Read programme in the early years, Read Write Count in early primary and of course the Reading Challenge. And we will continue to take forward the new detailed measurement system through the National Improvement Framework, which will track progress, uh, not just by way of a sample survey, but by using data on every pupil in primary one, four, seven and S3, broken down by local authority and schools. So in answer to Ruth Davidson's question, I feel determined to continue to get on with these reforms to make improvements for pupils right across our country. Ruth Davidson. Ten years and five out of every 30 pupils can't write properly. <laughs> Presiding officer, we like to pride ourselves in Scotland that our education system was the best in the world. And after 10 years of this SNP government, we can do so no longer. Now, last week I sat, stood here and I raised the fact that teacher training places are not being filled. And yesterday, we learned about the standards of that training. On the time spent on literacy, one trainee said it would be a single week, one week. And another said that she and her fellow trainees don't, and I'll quote this directly, they don't have the sufficient skills in numeracy to be able to teach it to 11-year-olds at a reasonable standard. So we've not enough trainee teachers coming through, and the ones who are, aren't being taught properly. And that's not their fault. But if they're not getting the proper instruction, what chance do they have of teaching our children? Yeah. First Minister. Firstly, I think, as I said also last week, while we should not, and this government does not ignore the challenges we face in Scottish education, equally, we should not do a disservice to pupils and to teachers across the country. Uh, as I've just said, 80... More than 80% of S3 pupils, according to the comprehensive data we publish, are meeting the required standards in writing. We're also seeing annual increases in the proportion of school leavers reaching the National 5 level. We're seeing the gap between the richest and the poorest closing. We've seen a record number of advanced higher passes, a record number of higher passes in the last few years. But let me turn also to the question of teacher uh, education. In terms of uh, entry into uh, initial teacher education, of course, we've increased the intake into teacher education as part of the work we are doing to make sure there are the required numbers of teachers coming into our schools. But in terms of the content of teacher education, which is the substance of the question that Ruth Davidson asked and has obviously been under discussion at the Education Committee this week, there's a couple of uh, points to make first before I talk about the action that we have been taking. 
Firstly, it's universities, of course, in partnership with the GDC that decide the content and the structure of initial teacher education. And here's a fact. Well, well. here's a fact that Ruth Davison won't like to hear because it says something good about Scottish education. The recently published Complete University Guide rated four of Scottish universities in the top seven across the UK for teacher education. But we have recognised that we need to do more around teacher education, which is why, and I'm surprised Ruth Davison doesn't seem to know this uh, from the content of her question. In our uh, delivery plan published last uh, year, we committed to a review of Scotland's initial teacher education courses. And the report of that review will be published in the next few weeks. So on that, as well as on the other issues, uh, this is the situation, presiding officer. Uh, we've got good performance across education in Scotland, but there are areas where we have recognised that we need to do better. And this government is getting on with the job of taking the action that will deliver these improvements. Ruth Davidson. Here's a fact for the First Minister. Bright young trainees are starting their careers in Scotland without the tools they need to do the job. And that's not me saying it, that's what they told this Parliament just yesterday. Now, as the Education Secretary acknowledged this week, we need inspections to flag up issues in our schools. But the number of inspections has gone down under the SNP. And why has it gone down? Because one, we don't have enough inspectors. And the ones that we do have are being dragged off the job to sort out the complete mess that is Curriculum for Excellence. Now, can I ask the First Minister, does this sound like a system that is in any way functioning properly? Yeah. First Minister. What she's just said about Curriculum for Excellence, not only does Ruth Davidson go against what her party has said previously about Curriculum for Excellence, yeah. she goes against the judgment of the OECD when they did a, a, a review of Curriculum for Excellence and said that that was a reform that they welcomed, but they pointed out the areas where we had to further improve to deal with the challenges we face. So what we have in education is good performance, and we have a range of international experts uh, who have said that. We have a number of challenges, not least the ones that the SSLN uh, survey has highlighted this week, but we have a programme of reform that is getting on with making the changes backed by significant additional investment in our schools that are about delivering improvement. So I think it is important that this parliament uh, scrutinises that on an ongoing basis. But as First Minister, with the Deputy First Minister, I'm going to stay focused in taking forward this reform programme. Because as I said last week, what we often find in this chamber is opposition parties calling for us to make changes, but as soon as we make any of those changes, and as soon as some people uh, might uh, think that they disagree with them, we find opposition parties running for cover. Well, this government will continue to focus on making the reforms and making the changes that we think are required to drive the improvements we are determined to see. Ruth Davidson. So, it's funny, the First Minister talked about what a range of international experts had said about Curriculum for Excellence. She didn't actually say what they said, so let me read out one of them. <laughs> Professor Lindsay Patterson, here's what he says about Curriculum for Excellence. Curriculum for Excellence has ignored the need for deep knowledge with the dismaying uh, consequences that we now see. So every week we stand up here and we hear jargon about cross-curricular this and joined up that, but it's not much help if we have children in our country that can't add up, that can't write and can't read. Now, last week the First Minister accused me of being obsessed about the Constitution. Well, here is her record in this place. Since last year, this government has spent more time debating the, the Constitution than debating education, health, transport and justice combined. And we have had enough. After 10 years, after 10 years, don't the people of Scotland deserve a government that will for once focus on their priorities and not on hers? First Minister. <laughs> well, let me share, let me share some of the views. Order, that's enough. <laughs> First Minister. Let me share some of the views of the international experts uh, that I was referring to. Page 13 of the OECD Review of Scottish Education states this, the Curriculum for Excellence is an important reform putting in place a coherent 3 to 18 
curriculum. It rests on a very contemporary view of knowledge and skills and on widely accepted tenets of what makes for powerful learning. The Deputy Director of the OECD Directorate for Education uh, and Skills, we applaud Scotland for having the foresight and the patience to put such an ambitious reform as Curriculum for Excellence uh, in place. So that's the support, backed up by the International Council of Education Advisors, who said, we've been deeply impressed with the schools we have visited uh, during our programme uh, here. So we will continue to build on the strengths of Scottish education uh, and make sure we drive the improvements through the action that I have been talking about. The Attainment Fund, putting £120 million into the hands of head teachers. The Attainment Challenge, driving improvements in literacy and numeracy. And the new National Improvement Framework, making sure that we don't just have to rely on a sample SSLN survey. We have comprehensive data on every pupil in these particular uh, school years. So we'll continue to take forward uh, that programme of reform. Now let me turn to the issue of priorities, presiding officer, because you see when Ruth Davidson talks about the time spent in this chamber debating the constitution, what she's trying uh, to distract attention from is that that has been time, that has been time debating the implications of Brexit. The Brexit disaster. Brexit disaster that the Tory party is leading this country into. But secondly, presiding officer, on priorities. You know, over the past week, the Scottish Tories have churned out press release after press release after press release. And in all of those press releases, we have seen health mentioned once. We've seen education mentioned 12 times. We've seen me, the SNP, or independence, mentioned a grand total of 153 <laughs> times. So, presiding officer, I'll get on with the job of improving education, but I'll take no lectures on priorities from Ruth Davidson or the Tories. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you. Scotland's nurses need a pay rise. Since 2010, they have seen a real terms cut in their wages of £3,400. Our NHS staff are under resourced and underpaid. The Labour Party will always argue for better wages because it means better performance. And the reality of today's NHS is that nurses are more likely to leave the profession because the work just isn't paying as well as it should. The results? Hundreds of millions of pounds spent on agency staff. So why did the SNP vote against scrapping the pay cap last night? First Minister. Well, I think this is a really important issue, not just for uh, people working in our NHS, but for public sector workers generally. We've had a period of pay restraint uh, and the reasons for that pay restraint were firstly the financial crash and then uh, the long period of austerity started under Labour and continued under the Tories. And the reason for that pay restraint, and no government, certainly not this government, enjoys having that kind of pay restraint, but the reason was to protect jobs in the public sector and make sure that we can protect investment in areas of the public sector like our NHS. And as I've said previously, we're seeing more investment in our NHS today under this government than we would if Labour had been in government because they didn't even pledge as much as we did. But on the issue of pay, and can I say, I think this is an issue that we require to look very carefully at now that inflation is rising again. With the NHS, of course, it is the independent pay review body that makes pay recommendations. And the Health Secretary yesterday committed to working uh, with the health uh, unions to jointly commission work that we would then submit to the pay review body for its deliberations uh, for the next year. But, you know, we have taken action to make sure that we are treating uh, workers in our NHS as fairly as possible. So unlike governments elsewhere in the UK, we have targeted low pay 
Uh, and we've also made sure that we have always accepted recommendations of the pay review body and made sure that people working in our NHS aren't denied the progression that they have sometimes been denied elsewhere. And as a result of that, while I do not deny for a second the real pressure that people working in our NHS are under, as a result of that, in Scotland, every entry-level NHS uh, support staff uh, workers is paid more than £1,000 a year more than their English counterparts. And a Band 5 uh, nurse, which is the level for a newly qualified nurse, is paid £300 a year more than somebody doing the same job in England and crucially paid £312 a year more than a nurse doing the same job in Wales. Now why do I mention Wales? Because Labour is in government in Wales and they haven't even done as much as we've done to protect the pay of nurses. So we will continue to make sure that we work with our trade unions to get fairness for our nurses and for public sector workers. In all of that, President Officer, there is no escaping the reality that whilst they might be £300 better off than in England, they are £3,400 worse off than they should have been under her government. And the, the brutal reality of a decade of SNP has seen them make a complete and utter mismanagement of our NHS. Take a look at today's Times. The Times newspaper today reports a £400 million contract for private doctors to work in our NHS that went out to tender on the 1st of May. The brutal truth is our hospitals have to turn to private sector because they don't have enough doctors in the first place. Yeah. And Labour can reveal today that the number of consultant posts that have remained vacant for six months or more has increased sixfold since 2011. That's the reality of the complete and utter mess she has made of our NHS. So tell me, First Minister, why can't the SNP find £400 million for private health companies, but it can't find the money to pay our NHS nurses? First Minister. Well, I'll take no lessons on private sector involvement in our NHS from the Labour Party, who signed PFI contracts in our NHS that continues to drain the budgets. The reality is reliance on the private sector had reduced under this government and that is right and proper. But let's go back to the important issue of pay, not just in the NHS but in the public sector. I absolutely understand uh, why workers across our public sector think that the 1% pay cap it has now to be lifted and we'll continue to talk to trade unions. I was talking to civil service trade unions about this very issue uh, earlier this week and we'll continue to make sure that the evidence we submit to the pay review body for the NHS properly reflects the circumstances in the economy today. But we've had pay restraint because we have had an extremely tight public spending environment and we have had to make sure that we protect jobs in the public sector and protect investment in our national health service and the other thing that Kezia Dugdale won't want us to mention is the fact that we have also in Scotland had a policy of no compulsory redundancies in the public sector so we look at the NHS we see I think 12,000 uh, compulsory redundancies in the NHS it's uh, 20,000 20, south of the border uh, none here in Scotland so I am not standing here saying it is easy for anybody working in our NHS but because of the action we have taken uh, to make sure we target extra resources at low paid people make sure that uh, people working in our NHS get access to progression and because of that actually 60 percent of agenda for change staff it will actually have been paid more than the one percent uplift when their progression and action in low pay is taken into account and I don't think it is at all fair for Kezia Dugdale uh, simply to dismiss the fact that we have done more than any other government anywhere else in the UK to try to help public sector workers in this difficult time uh, and we will continue to do exactly that because the difference is this government stands on the side of public sector workers in the NHS and elsewhere too. Two things come from that, presiding officer. First of all, in all of that answer, she's actually asking us to be grateful that she's not sacking nurses because of her compulsory redundancy policy. And secondly, 
Secondly, there is a clear difference between our two parties, because whilst I have a progressive plan to protect our public services and stop the cuts, all she has a plan is to see the private sector profit from Scotland's sick. That is the reality. And the Times report today also tells us the amount of private money going into the NHS has doubled in the last two years alone under her watch. Let's look at those facts. Our hospitals don't have enough nurses. Those nurses don't have enough money in their pocket. Our hospitals don't have enough doctors, but there's enough money for private health firms. Is this what the NHS looks like when the government is more interested in running a referendum than running the NHS? First Minister. Well, let's look at private sector spend. Private sector spend fell last year in NHS Scotland. It represents 0.7% of the Scottish Government's total health resource budget. In comparison, in a trend started under the last Labour government, the NHS in England spends 7.6% of its budget on the private sector. So we will continue to make sure that we are investing in the public NHS, not the private sector. And interestingly, one of the first things I did when I was Health Secretary was scrap the private contract for the running of Stracathro Hospital that was introduced by the last Labour administration. So the problem, the problem for Labour here is all these things uh, they pontificate about in opposition are things they failed to do when they had the opportunity in government. And lastly, presiding officer, I don't expect, I don't expect anybody working across our public sector to be grateful to any government because they are dealing with extremely tough times and I recognise that and I recognise that particularly for people working at the front line of the NHS but I would expect opposition parties to recognise that in these tough times this government has done more in terms of public sector pay than any other government across the UK. That's why Agenda for Change staff are paid more in Scotland than they are in England, and it's why newly qualified nurses are, paying, are paid more in Scotland than they are in England and in Labour-governed Wales. So we will continue to take the right action in our NHS, which of course is meaning that we have record funding in our NHS and we have record numbers of staff working in our NHS as well. Thank you. I'm conscious we've taken a lot of time for our first two questions. Serious issues, though, they are. And there's a number of members who wish to get in today and a lot of questions. So if we can make progress, ask all members to help make progress. Two constituency questions. The first from John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. First Minister, North West Highland Geopark won its UNESCO status in uh, 2015. That was after 10 years of hard work by local communities. That status is assessed every four years, and it's next due to be assessed in 2019. Until now, the Scottish Government has provided core funding to the Geopark. This year, the Scottish Government uh, took the decision not to supply core funding. The, the Geopark have uh, put up a, a crowdfunder which closes on Monday. Thus far, they've only raised £12,767, uh, 18% of the total that's required. Given the effort that's gone into achieving that UNESCO status, it would be a disaster if that status was lost. First Minister, would you agree to have your officials examine options for providing the modest financial support to allow the West Highland Geopark to work to retain its UNESCO Geopark status, please? First Minister. Can I thank John Finney for raising this issue? Uh, I am uh, familiar with Geopark and the UNESCO status that it's got, and I absolutely agree that is extremely important. Um, as I uh, recall it, the Scottish Government provided initial core funding, uh, but that was uh, with a view to Geopark then becoming sustainable. Uh, I am, though, happy to ask officials to have a look at this again um, and to consider whether there is anything further the Scottish Government can do to help, and I will make sure that we report back to John Finney once we've had the opportunity to look at it. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Our Gowan Bowling and Tennis Club in Greenock is a 175-year-old club offering vital sporting facilities to the people of Inverclyde. But changes to water and sewage charge exemption rules has left them facing a bill of up to £2,000 per annum, which they fear could drive up membership costs or even force them to close doors. And I'm afraid they're not the only ones. What comfort can the First Minister provide charities, clubs, village halls and sporting groups right across Scotland that the government will seriously look at these charges and will she commit to a full and open review into this policy? 
First Minister. Well, it's not too long, of course, since we had a full review of the situation uh, around charities with uh, water rates or exemptions from water rates. And I remember it well because uh, at the time I was the, the minister in charge of taking forward the recommendations from that review. And I remember well that we tried to put in place a system that was as fair as possible to as many charities across uh, the country as possible. Now, uh, the tests for exemptions are based on the income of, of charities uh, and capital that, that charities uh, hold. And therefore, there will always be some uh, charitable organisations uh, that don't get exemptions because they have income or capital that are above those thresholds. Uh, and the point I would make, I'm, I should say I'm more than happy to have the relevant minister look at the particular organisation that has been uh, cited here. I'm looking in the wrong direction, it's Rosanna Cunningham, uh, to look at the particular organisation uh, to make sure that the rules are being ap applied appropriately. But the, the genuine point I would make um, is I think all members would recognise that with any system of exemptions like this, there will always be some organisations that do not qualify for the exemptions. And I know that that will be uh, very difficult for uh, organisations who are in that position. But I'll ask Rosanna Cunningham uh, to look at this particular case and report back to the member in due course. Question number three, Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. Yet again, we've heard about the poor statistics on education. The mother of a 15-year-old schoolboy said to me yesterday that she is worried her son could be one of those statistics. He is struggling with reading and writing. She is anxious about his future. And she is also angry with the SNP who have been in charge for the whole of her son's education. What has the First Minister got to say to that mother and her son? First Minister. Well, I'm concerned to learn of any parent anywhere in the country who has concerns of that nature about their child's education. Um, and I would repeat again how seriously I and this government take the challenges that we face in education. I won't repeat, as I uh, did with Ruth Davidson, all of the strengths of Scottish education. And I do think it is unfair to teachers working hard across uh, the, the country not to recognise those strengths and to recognise some of the real improvements that we're making. Uh, one of the ones I didn't mention earlier on uh, was the improvements in attainment of uh, pupils with additional support needs, for example. But it's because we recognise uh, some of these challenges that we are taking the action that we are taking. So I obviously don't know the school uh, that the child uh, quoted, or the child of the parent quoted by Willie Rennie goes to, uh, but it is very, very likely uh, the, the head teacher of that school now has in his or her own hands additional resources, significant additional resources to invest in the specific areas that that head teacher thinks are required to improve attainment. And it's exactly that kind of action that we are determined to continue to drive forward. And I would say to Willie Rennie, many of the reforms we are taking forward are reforms that he is opposing. So y yes, I think it is absolutely right that members uh, bring concerns to this chamber. Uh, but we also then have to be prepared to do the difficult things that are required to see the improvements that we all want to see. Willie Rennie. I'm afraid that's just more promises to improve school education at some point in the future. It won't help that schoolboy now. He could be part of a lost generation. He has been at school for a decade. Every single day of that, the SNP education secretaries have been in charge and they still sit round the cabinet table today. These are the education secretaries that rejected a pupil premium for six whole years, even though it raised attainment in England. They delayed nursery education for two-year-olds, rejected a penny on income tax for education, and cut thousands of places from our colleges. When the First Minister and her ministers have got it so wrong for years, why on earth should that mother and our 15-year-old son ever trust them again? First Minister. Well, firstly, these are important issues and important challenges that we've got to face. But I would say to Willie Rennie, I do think it does a real disservice to the young people of our country to use language like a lost generation. I think that is pretty disgraceful. Secondly, Willie Rennie, Willie Rennie uh, talks about investments that he thinks we should have made uh, years ago. I would simply remind Willie Rennie that those years gone past are exactly the years that the Liberal Democrats were in a Westminster coalition with the Tories cutting Scotland's budget year after year after year. But the last point I would make, 
it is the most is the most important point. Uh, Willie Rennie says that the young man uh, and the parent that he talks about, what good will this do now? Well, the money I'm talking about that is in the hands of head teachers is in the hands of these head teachers right now. I, I've spoken to head teachers uh, in my constituency uh, who are already talking about the initiatives they're taking forward with this investment. So the additional investment uh, direct to head teachers, uh, the extra investment elsewhere in our attainment fund, uh, but also the measures we are taking forward to ensure that we can track the progress uh, as a result of these measures. And Willie Rennie uh, repeatedly stands up in this chamber and opposes the things we're trying to do to make sure that we can see these improvements and make sure we can be accountable to every parent across this country as well as to this chamber. So we'll get on with doing the things that need to be done, even sometimes when they are difficult and they don't get the support of the Liberal Democrats. Okay, I'd like to squeeze in a few topical supplementaries. The first from Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last night, BBC Scotland broadcast a shocking documentary on the human trafficking trade. It provided clear evidence that young girls are being trafficked from Slovakia to Govan Hill in Glasgow, where they are forced into sham marriages to local men. This is a scandal and a human tragedy, which is going on right under our noses here in Scotland right now. Can the First Minister set out what her government will do to support girls who arrive here in such appalling circumstances and what measures can be taken to crack down on trafficking, who, traffickers who indulge in this evil trade. First Minister. Well, this is a, an extremely important issue. It is, as Annie Wells is right to say, uh, both a terrible crime, uh, and that is what human trafficking is. It's also uh, a global problem, uh, but it's important that we take robust steps to tackle it, both in cracking down on the crimes that are being committed, but also, as Annie Wells also points to, making sure we're supporting uh, the victims. Now, in terms of uh, tackling the crime, the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Act that was passed by this Parliament in 2015 gives both police and prosecutors uh, enhanced powers to detect and prosecute those who are responsible for human trafficking. Uh, police Scotland also uses uh, joint investigation teams which are established under European law to work uh, with Romanian and Slovakian police in this area. And it's vital that Police Scotland continues to do, as it does already, to work closely with uh, UK immigration, uh, Europol and other uh, nations' police forces in order to investigate human trafficking offences and bring those responsible uh, to justice. So we will continue to make sure that our police force uh, have the powers and the resources to investigate and to tackle what are evil uh, crimes against these individuals. Uh, the second important point, though, is how we support victims of human trafficking. And uh, we continue to support what is invaluable work of organisations that offer assistance to victims. Uh, in 2017-18, uh, 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 the government will provide a grant funding uh, of £800,000 to uh, specific organisations uh, who support adult victims of human trafficking, and that's an increase on previous funding. Uh, we'll also continue to work with them to improve the support available uh, to prevent re-trafficking. So there's a whole range of, I don't have time to go into all of it, I'd be happy to write to the member with more detail of the work that we are doing, but we should all agree uh, that the crime of human trafficking is evil. We've got to bring those responsible to justice, but also provide the support that victims need, and the government will continue to focus on doing exactly that. Richard Lockhead. As the First Minister may be aware, there is huge disappointment and indeed some shock following the decision by the Crown Office after a prolonged police investigation and I'm told nine separate court hearings to drop the case relating to the alleged illegal killing of a hen harrier in the Cabroch in my constituency back in 2013. The Crown Office appears to have taken the view that video footage supplied by the RSPB was inadmissible despite such evidence being accepted in the past. So notwithstanding the progress made by ministers in recent years tackling wildlife crime, Will the First Minister acknowledge that this case represents a serious crime against a threatened species and that given that wildlife crime is very difficult to detect because most often it takes, remote, it takes place in remote areas, the law and the approach of the Crown Office must take into account such factors. So can I ask the First Minister if she would be willing to investigate this case with a view to ensuring that the justice system doesn't miss any opportunity to hold those who illegally kill an endangered, endangered species to account? First Minister. Um, yes, I do agree uh, very much with Richard Lockhead. Uh, as Richard Lockhead well understands, decisions about the prosecution of crime, of course, are decisions for the, the Crown Office and the uh, law officers act in that respect independently of ministers. But I do think it's important 
that we take wildlife crime uh, very seriously indeed, particularly in cases where, as Richard Lockhead uh, has highlighted today, it threatens uh, threatened species. Uh, so I would be happy to ask the uh, relevant minister, uh, Rosanna Cunningham, again uh, to, to meet with uh, Richard Lockhead to look at what more we can do, uh, particularly taking into account his point about often these crimes taking place in remote areas and therefore they are more difficult to detect. Uh, but it's important that we make sure that the policy framework, the law around this, and although, as I say, it is independent of ministers, the decisions that are taken by the Crown Office in respect of prosecutions are doing everything possible to crack down on these kinds of crime. And I can assure Richard Lockhead that we'll continue to do everything we can to make sure that's the case. Rhoda Grant. College lecturers have been forced out on strike for the fourth day in this current dispute, impacting on them, their families and on their students' education and exams. Can I ask how many days lecturers will need to strike before the First Minister intervenes to ensure the pay deal is honoured? And does she agree with me that preparation time is essential in order to enable high quality learning? First Minister. Um, yeah, yes, I do agree with that last point. Uh, I want to see this dispute settled. Um, I do not want to see college lecturers uh, on strike. It's not in their interest. It's certainly not in the interest of college students across the country. Um, as members will be aware, and I won't uh, go into all of the detail of this, we have moved to a position of national bargaining. Um, and uh, these discussions are about the harmonisation uh, not just of pay but of terms and conditions, uh, moving to a new national pay scale uh, which will see a significant pay rise for the vast majority of college lecturers and that is agreed. Uh, the discussions now are about how uh, different college by college terms and conditions uh, are replaced with a national system. Now talks are continuing um, and I would encourage both sides uh, to go the extra mile including and perhaps especially the employers given their position to go the extra mile to reach an agreement. But I would say in terms of the point about government intervention, and I, I, I take this very seriously because ministers, I have to say, have been uh, speaking regularly with both sides in this dispute, trying to make sure we are doing everything to encourage them to move towards a resolution. But the move to national bargaining was something that the unions rightly long campaigned for, and it's something that I'm delighted to say this government has delivered. But if we have a situation where in order to resolve a dispute, a government has to step in and intervene, then that's not uh, the success of national bargaining. That would be the failure of national bargaining. So ministers will continue to discuss with both sides. We will do everything we can uh, to bring this dispute to a settlement. Uh, talks are ongoing formally and informally, uh, I think today and certainly tomorrow. And I would hope we would see a resolution uh, of this because that's in the interest of college uh, lecturers and also college students uh, and I hope uh, that reassures uh, the member uh, that the government will continue to make sure that we're doing everything possible to bring that about. Thank you. There are four more questions if we can get through them all maybe. Question four, Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to uh, refer members to my register of interest to ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is marking Mental Health Awareness Week. First Minister. Well, <coughs> I welcome the opportunity to highlight Mental Health Awareness Week. It is important that we all do what we can to raise awareness and reduce stigma around mental health. Uh, to mark the week, uh, the Minister for Mental Health met with parents of children with experience of mental health services in Forth Valley and last night spoke at an event to discuss mental health stigma within the workplace. Uh, we will hold the first meeting of a biannual stakeholder forum on the 23rd of June. Uh, that is a specific commitment in our new mental health strategy uh, because we know that working with stakeholders will be key to building on the actions of the strategy in the years ahead. Claire Hockey. I thank the First Minister for that answer. In my opinion, one of the most important actions outlined in the recent mental health strategy is a commitment to introduce a managed clinical network for perinatal mental health. Can the First Minister outline how the network is being progressed and how it will help mothers experiencing mental health problems? First Minister. Well, progress is being made in that regard and I'm happy to confirm that just this week the lead clinician for the managed clinical network for perinatal mental health has been successfully appointed. Scottish Government officials attended the Maternal Mental Health Scotland Annual Conference on Monday and heard uh, first hand from mothers their experiences in asking for and getting the right help. Uh, and I would expect the new network to help us get it right for parents and their children by driving up standards of care through integration of services and more collaboration. Question five, Alison Harris. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government has had discussions with SEPA to encourage it to have staff based in Grangemouth on a regular basis. First Minister. 
The Scottish Government is in regular contact with the Scottish Environment Protection Agency to support its delivery of regulatory and other services, as well as the management of the SEPA estate. SEPA staff are present in Grangemouth on a regular basis as part of their duties to deliver regulatory functions. Uh, but I understand that following discussion with the Community Council and locally elected members, SEPA has now agreed to consider the benefits and costs of establishing a Grangemouth site that can support the wider Stirling based area team. Alison Harris. I thank the First Minister for that and I welcome the fact that SEPA are now going to have those discussions for Grangemouth. Thank you. First Minister. It doesn't really require an answer. Oh, we want to question. <laughs> <laughs> question six, Polly McNeill. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to better resource planning authorities in light of an increase in planning fees for major applications from the 1st of June 2017. First Minister. We need a planning system that supports both businesses and communities to deliver high quality development on the ground. Uh, there has been a general understanding that fee levels are too low and in many instances they're not in proportion to the work involved in processing planning applications. Uh, we've always been clear that fees and performance go hand in hand, therefore we're increasing the maximum fee for major planning applications to provide further resources to councils to improve performance. Uh, the government will continue to work with all stakeholders to ensure that planning uh, services deliver for Scotland's communities. McNeil. The First Minister will be aware that the National Review of Planning Fees that she's mentioned, uh, that maximum fees have risen from 30,000 to 125,000. And let me say, this is a welcome resource for local authorities. Many planning authorities have done an excellent job despite cuts to personnel. But organisations such as Homes for Scotland, RTPI and smaller building firms we simply just want to make sure that there is a corresponding improvement in the service for those fees. Would the First Minister recognise that uh, these, these costs could be prohibitive if there is not a dramatic improvement in waiting times? In particular, I'm looking at the figures for house building where there's an average wait of 48 weeks. I know the government has a strong interest in this, planning to build 50,000 houses. And I would just like to know what the First Minister can do to ensure that those additional costs are spent on improving the planning system itself. First well, I think I'd make two quick points. Uh, firstly, and I think it's important to stress at this point, the maximum fee and, and the fee increase only applies to major applications, which account for less than 1% of all applications. So it wouldn't impact on our plans to deliver 50,000 affordable homes. Um, but the second point is important. The, the fee increase is deliberately about giving councils resources to improve performance. Uh, improving planning performance and doing it on a consistent basis across the country is one of the things we can do to boost economic growth in Scotland. So it's vital that these increases do lead to that uh, improvement in, in performance. I, I should say we are seeing improvements, uh, re reductions in waiting times, for example, but there's more that can be done here. And I hope that this increase in the fee uh, together uh, with uh, the actions we'll take forward from our wider review of planning will help with that very much in the period ahead. And question seven, Kenneth Gibson. <coughs> Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the first minister, in light of the local government elections, where the Scottish Government will act to randomise the ordering of candidates by surname on ballot papers at future elections. First Minister. Somebody whose surname starts with an S, then uh, I can see the attraction in it. Um, can I begin by congratulating all uh, councillors elected last week? I'm sure uh, everybody across the chamber will join me in wishing them well in their uh, roles to support our local communities. Uh, following the successful electronic count last week, randomised ordering of candidates' surnames is one of the innovations that the Scottish Government will consider for future local government elections. I should say no decisions have been taken, uh, but it's one of the changes that will be subject to consideration. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for that answer. The SNP randomises its own internal SNP ballot, so it seems only reasonable for the SNP Government to introduce such a measure in local elections. The single transferable voting system produces results heavily biased in relation to surnames, regardless of vote management strategies which parties use to try and steer voters from one candidate to a party colleague. In Glasgow, 40 of the 43 contests where two or more candidates from the same party stood, the individual within each party whose surname is closest to the beginning of the alphabet received the highest number of their party's votes. Glasgow City Council is thus populated by a ween of Aitkins, Balfours, Cullens and Doherty's. Does the First Minister agree, therefore, that after three elections fought under the single transferable voting system, there is clearly something wrong when one surname can prove such a decisive factor 
and whether one is elected. I do not agree that if this is not addressed, the very credibility of the single transferable vote system is at stake. First Minister. I think that has to count as a classic Kenny Gibson <laughs> question. Um, can I say just... Uh, before I, I address the substance of Kenny Gibson's question, I'm absolutely delighted that there was an Aitken elected in Glasgow yeah. because Councillor Susan Aitken, of course, is set to be the new SNP leader of Glasgow City Council, and I'm delighted about that. But on the serious issue, um, it's, it's important that no candidate in any election is at an unfair disadvantage. I think we would all agree with that, and that's why we have already said that we'll examine the particular issue that Kenny Gibson has raised. But it's also important, I think, with any uh, changes to how we do elections, that we build consensus around that. It's not for any one uh, party to decide on those changes. So as we look at that, we will be looking carefully at opinion, not just across the parties, but across Civic Scotland as well. So as we do uh, have this consideration over uh, the next few years, I would encourage everybody, not just in this chamber, but across Scotland to contribute to it so we can build maximum consensus uh, as we go forward. Thank you very much. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Murder Fraser. Point of order in relation to the selection of questions for First Minister's questions. Question three is allocated weekly as an open question to a leader of an opposition party in order to hold the Scottish Government to account. Given that the Scottish Green Party is now effectively a wholly owned subsidiary of the Scottish <laughs> National Party, <laughs> is it still appropriate for the Green Party leader to be granted an opposition question in this manner. Thank you, Mr Fraser. I think the Chamber's reaction told you that that is a political point, not a point of order. We'll move on to members' business in the name of Gail Ross on International ME Day, and we'll just take a few moments to change seats. <laughs>